Go Basic Science video topic, Breast Disorders. Breast disease encompasses a wide spectrum of disorders that range from benign to malignant disease. The different etiologies of breast disease fluctuate depending on the patient's age, with benign disorders more common in premenopausal women and malignancy more common in older patients. The objectives of this video include understand normal breast anatomy and histology, identify common benign breast disorders and breast cancer, and describe the mechanism of action for hormonal therapies used in breast cancer treatment. To review the clinical aspects and management of breast disorders, please see the APCO educational topic number 40 on disorders of the breast. Let's meet our patient. She's a 50-year-old who presents to clinic for routine GYN exam. She has no particular concerns, but would like a referral for screening mammogram. Before you do her exam, let's review the normal anatomy and histology of the breast. Breast tissue is composed of both stromal and epithelial tissue. The stromal tissues comprise the majority of breast volume and include adipose and fibrous connective tissue. The epithelial tissue is a ductal system which transports milk from the lobules to the nipple. Each breast has about 12 to 20 lobes. Let's zoom in. Each lobe consists of lobules, which is drawn here. They consist of alveoli or acini, sac-like structures where milk is synthesized and secreted. The lobules drain into a terminal duct. The lobules and the terminal duct in which they drain is known as the terminal duct lobular unit, or TDLU. Remember this term as it will come up again later. The ducts are surrounded by myoepithelial cells to allow for milk ejection. Let's take a look at normal histology. In this image, you can see a TDLU with both lobules and a duct. In higher power with a special saying, myoepithelial cells are brown and surround the inner ring of ductal cells. The terminal ducts then drain into larger collecting ducts. Prior to the nipple, there is a dilation of the duct known as a lactiferous sinus, which then opens to the nipple. There are about six to eight openings to the nipple. Let's go back to our patient. Her breast exam is normal and no suspicious masses are palpated. You order a mammogram. A couple days later, her results come back. There's an abnormal area seen on the mammogram and biopsy is recommended. She is nervous and would like to know if it's cancer. You discuss with her the possibility of benign versus malignant disease. Let's start by reviewing benign breast disorders. They are classified histologically into three categories, non-proliferative, proliferative without atypia, and atypical hyperplasia. The risk of developing breast cancer increases as we move to the right. Non-proliferative disorders are generally not associated with increased risk of breast cancer and include breast cysts and fibrocystic change. Breast cysts are most common in women between the ages of 35 to 50. They are fluid-filled and round or ovoid in shape. Fibrocystic change is very common in reproductive age women and can cause cyclic pain in palpably nodular tissue. What does it look like under the microscope? On the left is a normal TDLU and on the right is fibrocystic change. With fibrocystic change, there is dilation of acini in ducts with dense stroma. Proliferative without atypia disorders increase the risk of developing breast cancer by 1.5 to 2. They include intraductal papilloma, fibroadenoma, and usual ductal hyperplasia. Intraductal papillomas typically present with serous or bloody nipple discharge. They are most commonly found less than 2 centimeters from the nipple. If this is a duct wall, imagine a broccoli stalk shaped growth inside the duct. They are the proliferation of epithelial cells within the ducts, appearing as fronds, and attached to the inner wall of the duct with a central fibrovascular stalk. Surgical excision is generally recommended. Fibroadenomas are common from age 15 to 35 and present as a well-defined mobile mass. They generally do not increase the risk of cancer, but can slightly increase risk, such as if they have complex features. Microscopically, there is a dense stromal component with compressed ducts. You can see a sharp interface with normal breast tissue, which makes the mass well circumscribed. Fibroadenomas can be observed or be surgically excised. Usual ductal hyperplasia retains cytological features of benign cells. No additional treatment is needed. Microscopically, there are increased cells in parts of the duct. The last category in benign breast disorders is atypical hyperplasia. These disorders increase the risk of subsequent breast cancer with a relative risk of 3.7 to 5.3 and include atypical ductal hyperplasia or ADH, atypical lobular hyperplasia or ALH, and often includes lobular carcinoma in situ or LCIS. But note that the relative risk of breast cancer is different. LCIS is associated with a 7 to 10 times increased relative risk of breast cancer. 
ADH is similar to low-grade DCIS, which we will discuss later in this video, but is a less extensive lesion, measuring less than 0.2 centimeters. It is the proliferation of low-grade neoplastic ductal epithelial cells, filling part but not the entire involved duct. Surgical excision is generally recommended as rates of pathology can be upgraded to more severe disease in 10 to 20 percent of cases. Atypical lobular hyperplasia is similar to LCIS, but with less extensive disease. Proliferation of low-grade neoplastic cells fill less than 50 percent of asini in an involved lobule with slight distension. Since the rate of upgrade of pathology is low, less than 5 percent, treatment can be observation. Let's compare ALH to lobular carcinoma in situ, or LCIS. As noted previously, LCIS is associated with a 7 to 10 times increased relative risk of breast cancer. It has greater extent of disease than ALH with increased SNI distension. In the majority of cases, nuclear grade is low. In this histopathology image, you can see LCIS compared to a benign TDLU. Zooming in, you can see intraductal proliferation of cells that are fairly homogeneous and are loosely arranged or discohesive. LCIS is poorly understood and it is not clear how it directly leads to breast cancer. Like ALH, treatment is typically close observation rather than surgery. Our patient's biopsy comes back as ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, sometimes referred to as stage zero cancer. This is typically diagnosed after there are microcalcifications on mammogram. As seen in this image, cancer cells fill the ductal system without invading beyond the basement membrane. Unlike in LCIS, the cells are cohesive. In this image, cells are low nuclear grade and cells are homogeneous. This image demonstrates a higher grade DCIS lesion. There is variability in size of the cells and prominent nucleoli. Comedonecrosis is when there is a necrotic core in the center of a duct filled with cancer cells. High nuclear grading and the presence of comedonecrosis increase the recurrence risk of DCIS or invasive disease. Treatment is surgical excision. When found on core biopsy, 10-20% to 20 of patients will have invasive cancer on subsequent excision. Let's discuss invasive breast cancers. Prognosis and treatment decisions are based on hormone receptor status, nuclear grade, and HER2-new expression. HER2-new is a type of receptor tyrosine kinase that promotes the growth of cancer cells and is present in 25% of breast cancer patients. In addition, two-thirds of cases are estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor positive. A tumor that is ER positive has a better prognosis than ER negative. HER2-new cancers are generally highly aggressive but respond to targeted therapies and have good prognosis. Breast cancer usually presents as a breast mass or mammographic abnormality. Spread is to regional lymph nodes and can metastasize to the brain, bone, liver, lung, and ovaries. Let's pause, read, and apply. Which lymph nodes are most likely affected in breast cancer? The axillary lymph nodes are likely affected in metastatic disease. For lymphatic drainage, the majority of the breast drains to the axillary chain. Drainage also occurs through the supraclavicular nodes and internal mammary nodes, Invasive ductal carcinoma accounts for 80% of all breast cancers, and neoplastic cells invade the basement membrane. There is usually a solitary firm mass with poorly defined margins. Histologically, it is an infiltrative growth. Invasive cells often form ducts or clusters, pictured here. They are often found with background DCIS, which is circled in red. 75% are ER positive. Invasive lobular carcinoma accounts for 15% of all breast cancers. Neoplastic cells usually form cords or are arranged in a single file orientation. On higher power, you can see the single file pattern. Greater than 90% are ER positive. Less common breast cancer types include inflammatory breast cancer and Paget disease of the nipple. Paget disease of the nipple presents as an exogenous patch on the nipple and is usually associated with underlying DCIS or invasive breast cancer. There is intraepidermal proliferation of mammary type carcinoma cells. Look at the difference between an area of Paget disease compared to normal skin. On higher power, these cells appear as large and pale with a clear halo, and appear differently than normal keratinocytes. Treatment of breast cancer often involves surgical management with lumpectomy versus mastectomy, radiation to reduce local recurrences, and chemotherapy depending on if there are high-risk characteristics of the tumor. Adjuvant hormonal therapy is typically recommended in ER-positive tumors. Her biopsy demonstrated a low-grade DCIS that is ER positive. She undergoes lumpectomy and radiation therapy. Since the tumor was ER positive, she also decides to proceed with hormonal therapy to decrease risk. 
Common hormonal therapies include selective estrogen receptor modulators and aromatase inhibitors. Let's pause, read, and apply. How do SERMs work? They bind to estrogen receptors and exert tissue-specific effects. Shown here is the estrogen receptor with estrogen at its binding site. SERMs competitively bind at the receptors. Interestingly, they have mixed agonist and antagonist activity depending on the target tissue. For instance, a common SERM is tamoxifen. It has an antagonist effect in breast tissue, making it protective against invasive breast cancer, but has agonist effect on bone, which makes it protective against bone loss, and agonist activity on the endometrium. This is why women on tamoxifen are at higher risk for development of endometrial polyps, hyperplasia, and cancer. Aromatase inhibitors are typically used in postmenopausal women. In postmenopausal women, most of the circulating estrogen is from peripheral conversion of androgen to estradiol by the enzyme aromatase. Aromatase inhibitors reduce circulating estradiol in postmenopausal women, which is protective against breast cancer, but associated with greater rates of bone loss and fractures. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on breast disorders. We have covered a lot, including normal breast anatomy and histology, different types of breast disorders and cancer, and hormonal therapies used in breast cancer. Thank you.